Hey, Kurt. Hey, Tim. I'd like to start this episode with something that our guest said about bipedalism. And if that's not a familiar term to you, that's that's cool. No worries. We don't use that word every day, but the meaning is pretty simple and straightforward. Bipedalism means to use only two legs. And it's what humans do remarkably better than any other species. We stand erect on two legs. Okay. <laughs> Just listen. Uh, all right. Bipedalism, the most maladaptive, ridiculous evolutionary change that has ever existed. Bipedalism is a very uh, difficult thing to do. Dinosaurs did it, but they kept their backbone horizontal while they did it. Now, the backbone was meant to be a horizontal structure held in tension uh, in engineering terms. So what did hominins very cleverly do? They turned it through 90 degrees, so it became a vertical structure held in compression. Oi! which leads to the biggest cause of absenteeism in the workforce today and a great deal of problems, especially if you're uh, pregnant and your centre of mass is changing all the time. And, of course, when you're walking along, you have to take one foot off the ground and almost fall over before you take another step. So balance. By the, yeah, yeah, all the balance. So, so what humans do is have this very, very refined neuromuscular control of walking. and. One thing I'm amazed at at nature is one of, the, one of the things that people still don't know completely is how humans walk. Okay, so I, maybe I understand bipedalism a little bit better. And you just heard from our guest, Henry G. Henry is a paleontologist, author, and musician whose day job is to be the senior editor of the scientific journal Nature. And you're going to hear about a wide variety of Henry's passions in our discussion with him today. God, isn't that the truth? We're going to hear a wide variety. But it's important to note that we started our conversation with Henry discussing his latest book, A Very Short History of Life on Earth, which he reminds us is not only short, but it's small in size, making it really easy to gift wrap. Okay, which, which we think you should do because the book will make a great gift for whoever in your life. Get it, wrap it, use a little bit of wrapping paper. It's awesome. Well, Henry's writing really caught us off guard for how he takes incredibly complicated things and breaks them down into super easy to understand parts. Yeah, Henry brought us fresh doses of passion and curiosity that remind us how happy we are to be doing this podcast. He put big smiles on our faces when he talks about some of the most important changes in our world and not just human being stuff. But dinosaur stuff. And even even before that, Tim, like little yeah, microbe no. thingies and stuff that I can't oh. pronounce because those names are way too long. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Well, we hope you enjoy our conversation with Henry and that his wit and wisdom brings a smile to your face as well. And with that, we should say welcome to Behavioral Grooves, the podcast that explores human behavior through a behavioral science lens. I'm Tim Houlihan. And I'm Kurt Nelson. Along with our guests, we try to understand why we behave the way that we do and to shed some light on our thinking and actions. We tend to do this through interviews with psychologists or sociologists or behavioral economists. Economists? Oh my God, I can't even talk. But Henry isn't one of those. He is a paleontologist. But his insights on how we, as humans, evolved provides us with a deep insight into why we behave the way we do. I just got to say, I noticed that we interview a lot of ists. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes, we do interview a lot of ists. There yes, you go. Yes. Uh, well, I have to say that the conversation with Henry was really insightful and that we realized that our evolution didn't just shape our ability to survive. It shaped how we interact with the world, with each other, and it's instrumental in, of course, how we behave. And we are super excited to share this with you since it's fundamental in our understanding of human behavior. We covered a lot of ground, just like his book, in a very short amount of time. Yeah, If you like the episode or actually any of the episodes that we've done, we would appreciate it if you could share it with a friend or many friends. You could do that through social media, tweet about it, highlight it in a Facebook post, share our logo or link to an Instagram, or maybe be like an ancient non-monitored Luddite human 
<laughs> and just send an email. That would work too. <laughs> We've evolved past that, Tim. But if no, if email works for you, do it really. And if you really like us, we encourage you to leave us a review, mostly because it makes us feel like our tribe appreciates us. And mm. evolutionary speaking, that's a good thing but also because it does influence others to try us out and to give us a listen. Yeah. Just remember, we appreciate you listening. Even if you don't share this or don't leave a review, we really know that your time is valuable. We appreciate you taking time to listen to our podcast, and we're glad when you have a chance to share it. Yeah. With that, we encourage you to sit back and take a drink of your finest evolutionary cocktail and enjoy our conversation with Henry G. Henry G., welcome to Behavioral Grooves. Thank you very much. It's good to have you here. And uh, Kurt, do you want to get started on the speed round? Or, I will or? definitely get started on the speed round. So, Henry, do you prefer coffee or tea? Coffee, all the way. All the way? Wow. All the way. I mean, not uh, that English tea drinker. I like tea. I put up with tea. Uh, my wife <laughs> likes tea. My wife is a, the, 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 the daughter of a soldier, so she likes tea that your spoon can stand up in it, um, <laughs> that you can use to varnish furniture. Um, uh, and, yeah, I'll drink tea. I'm quite happy. I'll drink herbal tea, you know, tea made out of dandelion and turpentine or whatever they do and um but i'm i'm really a coffee person i can't really get going in the morning without a good strong brew so good to are. know yeah good to know um kurt i'm going to switch things up here I, I uh for the second question i'd like to i'd like to find out henry which would you, which imaginary concert would you prefer and so this is an imaginary duet concert well, you have for, a for double billing that- of for those that it, can't it, see, I'm closing my eyes so I can better okay. imagine. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Use your imagination. Uh, so I'm imagining. On, on on one bill, you've got Robert Johnson and BB King, oh. and then and on the other bill, you've got Bach and Beethoven. Which which concert would you prefer to attend? Oh shit, man. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, if I had to choose at gunpoint. I yes. mean, oh, that's boy. that's where you're at right now. It's well, gunpoint. They're all dead, I suppose. So it would be imaginary. So so Bach and Beethoven, it would have to be by a short head. Uh, short, yeah. Short, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was yeah. raised on Beethoven. Uh, yeah. Well, I was, um, you know, back in the back in the day when we had gramophones, my parents, <laughs> my parents would pacify the infant G in his playpen by putting on. The part Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony by Beethoven, and oh, uh, my favorite. Yeah, my it favorite. still brings tears to my eyes now. And I, w- it would come to the end, and the record would stop, and I'd say, "More Beethoven music." I would. <laughs> I mean, I just my mother just reports this, but I really got into Bach during the Bach Tercentenary in the whenever that was eighty five, something like that. Yeah, and yeah. Okay. Uh, that would be my Desert Island music, the Art of Fugue. Um, okay. Played, oh yeah. Played by the Juilliard Ju- Juilliard Quartet. Oh, that, that, yeah. uh, there's so much in there. Every time you listen to it, it's different. So Tim mentioned Robert Johnson and BB King and Bach and Beethoven. If you could, if you could switch, like pick pick one from Robert Johnson and BB King and one from Bach and Beethoven and intersperse those. Who would you pick from <laughs> Bach and BB? Bach and. Or you pick BB King? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, Robert Johnson was the progenitor. Of uh, of all these things we love, but BB King was oh the consummate BB oh, man. I mean, you know, he was writer just so, performer, so yeah. brilliant, such a fantastic songwriter performer. I love his kind of big band style, and wow. um, and his kind of twinkling has this kind of twinkling humor. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, you charming. Can, you can, you can hear that. You can almost hear the twinkle in his eye when he says. I've got a fine beautician in a very fine condition. And, uh... <laughs> okay, so back back in the days, or, or when we can really start traveling again, uh, would you rather travel on a fixed itinerary or no itinerary at all? Well, I'm I measure thirty two on the Baron Cohen Aspergometer, uh, so <laughs> I, I tend to love to be in control 
and prefer to know where I'm going. And my wife says I'm so unspontaneous. But there, <laughs> there is something. Uh, there's something very romantic about uh, an unfixed itinerary. And if I can basically curb my inbuilt anxiety, I think I prefer to to do an unfixed itinerary. As long as I can think that someone somewhere is fixing the itinerary, and I, they're just like <laughs> you're that someone's out there uh, pulling the strings yeah, to make sure so that everything goes yeah, well. That, that's right. Yeah, I much prefer that. Yeah. All righty. Uh, last speed round question: Which which had a bigger impact on the development of the Earth? The development of the scummy microscopic membranes between the rocks at the bottom of the sea, or the development of the anus? The anus. Absolutely. That, okay. Which, okay. So, so that's, that's, everybody... that's, the, that's the easy question. I mean, BB King versus oh. Beethoven. That's, that's hard. That's difficult. But, but anus, definitely. That's the one. So, help us understand why is the anus so important to the development of life on Earth and, mm. and the evolution that we've seen with it? Well, Kurt, if you're sitting comfortably, I shall begin. <laughs> Uh, uh, the, the development of scummy membranes is probably pretty much inevitable on any suitable planet. I mean, there are, what, 4,000 exoplanets and rising, and the great thing about life on Earth, apart from the fact that it exists, is that it develops so indecently quickly after the Earth formed, which suggests to me that life, at a very simple level, will develop pretty much inevitably. So the kind of scummy membrane level of organization. But the thing about the, 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 the anus was it, it allowed the development of poo or uh, fecal pellets, solid pellets of waste. So rather than animals diffusing waste in a kind of wash that got immediately slurped up by decay bacteria, which then slurped up all the oxygen in the water, the poo dribbles slowly to the bottom of the sea and accumulates at the bottom. So it was a race to the bottom. You see what I did there? <laughs> so so, so all, all, the, all the bacteria went whoosh. That's a sound effect. Whoosh to the bottom. And they did all their decay at the bottom of the sea so oxygen could accumulate in the rest of the water column and that would allow for animals larger than a period at the end of a sentence to accumulate uh, because they need lots of oxygen so uh, it was the anus that um that allowed that, that basically led to the circumstances that large animals could evolve and that's probably much rarer than scummy membranes so i'd say <laughs> the rare and beautiful innovation that is the anus uh, was the key to all intelligent life, which is why one tends to have one's best ideas while sitting on the loo. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There's uh, more wisdom already in this, one, one in this episode. To serve, yes. Truly, truly. Well, let's let's skip ahead. Uh, this this idea of uh, developing larger animals is uh, kind of fantastic to me when I think about the millions of years that it took to get up to the size of some of these very large dinosaurs, mm -hmm. hundreds mm -hmm. of billions of years mm -hmm. to get to the size of dinosaurs. But we haven't repeated that. We haven't gone back to uh, with maybe whales uh, mm -hmm. sort of being an exception, but, but animals aren't, aren't as big. Uh, humans got bigger, mm -hmm. but, but wh why is that? Why, why are we not seeing more dinosaur like size animals? Uh, that's, in our a, world that's, today? that's a, that's a, a good question. Um, it, Goodness, that's a probably a whole book in there. Yeah. Uh, uh -oh. <laughs> and, uh, well, there, there are a couple of things here. One is that uh, vertebrates, that includes us and dinosaurs, animals with backbones, tend to be rather large animals. The biggest invertebrate, the colossal squid, it's like a giant squid, but colossal, is you know maybe the maybe the uh, the the mass of a polar bear. Um, but mo most invertebrates are very, very, very small. I mean, microscopic. Uh, no vertebrate is microscopic, and all the really big animals are vertebrates, dinosaurs, whales. Human beings are rather large animals in general. And that's probably to do with the, 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 uh, the fact that early in the ancestry of vertebrates, our genes doubled in size, our genome doubled in size. Uh, uh, we have at least twice as many genes as most invertebrates. 
So there's mm. something, that, uh, and it's also to do with the uh, the way we develop. So uh, vertebrates tend to be uh, quite large. So you're not going to get any animal, and there are loads of different kinds, that's going to be as big as that. Also, large animals are, um, they consume a lot of resources, and they tend to have rather few offspring. Mm. So animals like that tend to be rare because they're usually uh, rather prey to uh, the ups and downs of of outrageous fortune. I mean, there there aren't many elephants and rhinos and things, and they tend to right. they tend to have right. rather uh, a, a small number of young. Not very often. I mean, giant tortoises, you know, big reptiles yeah. like that. So uh, it's probably best. To, uh, and, and animals with this slow generation time don't evolve very quickly. You need mm -hmm. fast generation time. So the things that evolve quickly and are quite nimble in the evolutionary stakes tend to be small. So being being large is quite good in the short term because you get to you have a longer reach consuming resources. You can go further uh, and to do more. Um, but then you have to support that uh, body mass and, and consume a lot of resources. You take up a lot of space. Uh, humans are rather remarkable, being both large and numerous, which causes problems. Uh, human beings, <laughs> human right. beings um, used not to be very numerous, and that was fine. But now human beings are numerous and consume between twenty-five and forty percent of all the Earth's net primary production, which is r r rather a worrying thought. <laughs> yes. and I, 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 I no a spoiler alert over those. Few of you who have yet to buy my book, uh, all available in all good bookstores. Uh, but do try and buy it from your local bookstore. I love to use uh, that marvellous service beginning with A and ending in N, but they've almost run out of copies. So so uh, it's, <laughs> it's flying off the shelves faster than they can print it, folks. So go to your local bookstore. Um, so where was I? Oh, sorry about well, that. That's okay. Dinosaurs grew so big because they had this amazing construction. Uh, they, they, they were basically full of air. They were full of air mm. pockets. Basically, dinosaurs, all dinosaurs were like birds. I mean, even your great big Brachiosaurus was a gigantic, unfeathered, four-footed bird because they, uh, they, they grew fast. They were built with a very lightweight construction, and they had this amazing way of breathing all the air went in the mouth, and it came out of the mouth, just like it does. But on the way, it had this remarkable uh, journey through various air sacs that contacted a lot of the organs of the body, including the liver, which produces a hell of a lot of heat. And having a lot of heat constrains the size of a creature, because you know that as an animal grows bigger but keeps the same shape, its surface area remains small compared with its volume. In other words, it has disproportionately more insides than outsides, if you uh -huh. get me. But yeah. because the dinosaurs had this heat handling system, they could grow bigger without boiling themselves from the inside. So this is why dinosaurs were so uniquely big. Of course, whales are mammals, but they can be big because they float. They, they can support their weight in water. Uh, and that's another reason why they can be very big. Oh, man. So, all right. I, 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 this is fascinating. We can go down all these different oh, paths. Oh, every do, rabbit hole. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, I, I do want to, uh, so the, the title of your book, Very Short History of Life on Earth. It's a pretty, pretty kind of out there, gargantuous kind of thing to take the whole life on Earth and put it into a, a short history. So who who did you write this book for? And 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 why do you, what would people get? I mean, for those couple people, our listeners, who haven't already bought it and, and are going to go to their local bookstore to buy it. Well, I have to say it's very small and therefore you won't use a lot of wrapping paper to wrap it up. So <laughs> don't use it, it's very small. Um, well, uh, to, primarily, I mean, I always write a book for myself. Uh, and okay. I think if you can't please yourself, you're not going to please anybody else. But I, I wanted to write, in the back of my mind, I had this idea of writing a book on the on, on the history of life on Earth, but it was really far at the back of my mind. You know, like it would be like in the back of the shed, like with the <laughs> rusty wow. with, with the barbecue and the rusty bike that you haven't got round to throwing out, and you know the the, the 
the lawnmower and, and everything, and you'd have to move everything to get it. <laughs> um, so I didn't get it out and play with it until one of my colleagues at, at Nature uh, called David Adam, who writes books, and we would get together. You know, in those days when we used to go to an office, we used to move <laughs> our carcass on a on a tr- thing called a train. I mean, people wouldn't believe you. And we used to go to an office, and at the office where we'd breathe each other's exhaled ha- air. I mean, oh god, just imagine. horrible. Imagine. Can't imagine. I mean, no. you know, people. It's like public executions. I mean, people used to di- <laughs> people used to go and witness people disemboweling each other. I mean, oh, the things people used to do. Anyway. Back in those days, we would talk about books, and David said, Henry, he said, because that's my name. Henry, he's, he's good like that. That's why he wrote The Leaders <laughs> at Nature. He, he said, why don't you write a book? Well, anyway, I, I just finished a book. I just finished another book. And after I finished a book, I'm saying, I'm not going to write another expletive book. And he says, well, why don't you write a book about all these amazing fossil creatures that have you've had the privilege of publishing in nature. So people in the entire world, the, the community of researchers, send nature their best research, and I should say other science publishing options are available, but uh, they send nature, and I've been privileged over, oh, well, in April, I, uh, in April I was, um, I've been at nature for 33 and a third revolutions, which is a long playing record. You, some people will get that joke. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, d- during that time, I've published feathered dinosaurs and uh, amazing weird creatures from the cambrian and loads and loads of incredible fossil humans including the weird fossil hobbit that came out of indonesia in 2003 and i thought that's a great idea so still protesting i wasn't going to write the expletive book i wrote the expletive book but it was quite a complicated book and it had a lot of anecdotes and um and a lot of ramblings and digressions but my marvellous agent, Jill, got this into a, a form that she thought people would read, which was basically a story, because I do tend to digress, as you may have, those of you who haven't heard the, who are going to hear the, the, the director's cut of this interview will realise that, <laughs> that, that, that I do tend to digress. But as one editor said to me a long time ago, Henry, just tell the story. Uh, and you did. I did. You did. And it took yeah. It seems like a very simple thing, but it had to go through a very simple idea, through a lot of complicated ideas, back to the simple idea you were going to do at the beginning. And it all kind of works well. Um, And I'm always amazed that that happens. I mean, my favourite author is Neil. One of my favourite authors is Neil Gaiman. And I love his stories and his books. I have a personal connection with Neil Gaiman. I was in the same class at school as his kid sister. So there you are. So I'm two handshakes away from Neil Gaiman. Uh, and he, he said somewhere that, that what you do when you write a book is you just write stuff on the paper any old how, and then you go through it again to make to make it look like you you knew what you were doing all along. Uh, so 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 yeah. there is a great deal of editing in there. So that's how I. But I think I've answered a different question. Oh, I am sorry. Uh, no, I think that's uh, that's yeah. absolutely wonderful. And uh, you know. Neil is one of my favorite authors as well, and and my only connection to him is he lives just the state over from us right now. So well, he, exactly. he's exactly really he's, close. He's right yeah. around the corner from you. Yeah, but he, uh, yeah. yeah, we both grew up. I in, run into him at the grocery store, I think. Uh, at some yeah, point, you know. yeah. So we grew up in East Sussex, the land of Scientology and wow. um, and <laughs> anthroposophy wow. and a lot of alien visitations and good knows what. In fact, in fact, his his book, The Ocean at the End of the Lane. It's so evocative for me because it's you know, the landscape that I grew up in in East Sussex in England is where we all where we grew up. Anyway, yeah. more fantastic. I, I want to start going past, uh, and we could talk about all the milestones in history and mm. and all of those factors. I, I want to get to hominins. I want to get to, mm. to mm. Homo sapiens at some mm. point here. Mm. So, so why had what? What do you see as the the demarcation points of when? Hominins started to become the dominant, and particularly then, obviously, Homo sapiens coming in. What were the factors that led to us, as you said, being populous, large, and consuming what a quarter to a third of all the all the resources on the on the earth? What were the what were those demarcation points? Well, uh, it's it's hard. You can only do these things retrospectively. 
But mm -hmm. um, there were a lot of biological factors that led to the invention of grandmothers uh, and <laughs> and uh, elders. And these include bipedality and babies with large heads and having a this standoff between mothers who want to get the baby out as quickly as possible and the baby who wants to stay there in as long as possible uh, <laughs> uh, because babies come out in a very undeveloped state and uh, the menopause, which allowed uh, women in particular to live for a long time after reproduction has ceased, which strangely allowed her to produce more descendants than if she had kept reproducing, competing for resources with her own daughter. So uh, the menopause allowed uh, humans to, you know, they say it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it was the elders that helped uh, women in particular raise uh, more children. And while the men were out hunting and the women were gathering and raising children, it, uh, and of course, another consequence of children being born in a very, a very undeveloped state is they have this state called childhood, which no other creature has. Uh, I should say that some whales are known to have menopause, but we won't worry about them. They're not <laughs> you, you, okay. they're not okay. talking to us. Although when I do go out onto the beach and uh, strip down to my boxer shorts, I do have to be aware that the Sea Mammal Research Unit don't come and scoop me up. But the, the, um, uh, the, the, uh, but, so a lot of things, it was a development of, 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 of basically history. It was teaching. It was the idea that people could pass on received wisdom. So people didn't have to keep inventing the same thing all over the, uh, over the time. And it, it's true now. I mean, you hear accounts of people visiting uh, remote villages for the first time. And the first thing the hosts do is take the visitor to this hut and wheel out this extremely old person who is the repository of all wisdom and story right. for the whole right. clan or group or tribe or whatever, whatever group it is. And uh, I think it was uh, really the idea that uh, people could um, carry a reservoir with tradition and therefore short circuit technology and evolution and, and they didn't have to keep inventing the wheel because you know grandma grandpa would say grandma uh, grandpa would be there because granny was there uh, and and he'd say uh, he'd say well we invented the wheel last time you don't have to invent it i remember when we invented the wheel i've already done it here's how to do it now go and invent go and invent a high fi cabinet you can do that <laughs> well you you also you also wrote that uh, that homonyms were the elite fighter jets of the animal kingdom so yeah, this is to do with bipedalism the most yeah. maladaptive ridiculous uh, evolutionary change <laughs> that has ever existed bipedalism is a very uh, difficult thing to do dinosaurs did it but they kept their backbone horizontal while they did it now, the backbone was meant to be a horizontal structure held in tension uh, in engineering terms. So what did hominins very cleverly do? They turned it through 90 degrees, so it became a vertical structure held in compression. Oi! Which leads to the biggest cause of absenteeism in the workforce today, and a great right. deal of problems, especially if you're uh, pregnant and your centre of mass is changing all the time. And, of course, when you're walking along... You have to take one foot off the ground and almost fall over before you take another step. So, balance. By the, yeah, yeah, all the balance. So, so what humans do is have this very, very refined neuromuscular control of walking. And one thing I'm amazed at at nature is one of the things that people still don't know completely is how humans walk. I mean, the mechanics of how humans walk. We can, we, but no, we, not us. I hate the pronoun we. I wish there were more of them. Anyway, um, pe pe people can now peer inside atoms and look to the edges of space, but we still don't know how humans walk. And there is no robot that can yet imitate the grace and fluidity of a human walking uh, and developing and changing and having this con precise control of balance. Now, any animal with four legs is like the Dakota DC-3 of the walking world. I mean, it's great. It's a workhorse. You can point it in the right direction and it'll keep going. But you only get the best fighter pilots to pilot F-35s because uh, fighter jets are very fast and very manoeuvrable, but the prices, they're very unstable. So mm -hmm. you have to have the, the most precise avionics to control one of these things. And 
human beings are like that, but it took quite a long time to achieve. Uh, but that's what I mean uh, by the elite fighter jets. So walking upright, we do it all the time without thinking, and it's a, it's, it's a marvel. And uh, I, I've never ceased to be amazed by uh, well, just yeah, human walking. Yeah, Maeve Leakey uh, suggested that bipedalism was the forerunner to um, to uh, manual dexterity, which then was sort of the the forerunner to uh, encephalization. And well, mm, mm, um, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. sorry, Tim, I was making rude noises. You could, hadn't finished the question. No, no, no. I mean, so, but it, because because the point that you're making, it feels like encephalization was happening, seemed to have to happen at the same time that bipedalism was was starting to grow, right? Because to, in order to control all these muscles, there had to be a bigger brain, right? Well, it's not, it's not, it's not how big it is; it's how you use it, as the actress said to the bishop. I mean, uh, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm not a great fan of encephalization. I mean, crows, for example, are very, very brainy. And they have the brain the size of a nut. Uh, and mm. uh, animals that are quadrupedal or even have, you know, no arms at all, use and make tools perfectly well. It's um, And the human encephalization happened a long time after bipedalism evolved. Mm. Uh, uh, okay. the, the, the brain development was uh, quite late in the day. It was uh, the bipedalism that happened first. And... It's a kind of teleological argument to say, well, we were bipedal in, in order that we could wave our hands around without having to use them for walking. That, that, that happened to, to come later. Uh, why people became bipedal is an open question. I mean, I, yeah. I come up with various ideas in the book, but they're all kind of post hoax scenarios. But it's the, the brain size development came later. But all sorts of things make tools. Even, you know, we know that monkeys make tools. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, by smashing rocks together, uh, and crows make tools, uh, and even octopuses make tools. It's it's no big deal anymore. Leakey didn't know that at the time, and at, back in the time, back in the day, they had a very human centric view of evolution. Uh, so that's my answer to that one. There's a God, we could go down so many different routes here, and I'm yeah. trying to figure out which is going to be best. But one of the things that you talked about in the book is this ability for for hominoids to to as you said, the, the the jet fighter, but we also can run for a long time. So we may not be as fast as the gazelle or mm. as fast, but we can run for a long time and just wear out that yeah. prey as part of that. But but with that, you also talk about this cooperation. That, yes. that, that's yes. not a lone thing. So how important was the cooperation part to the you know, as as we came and, and survived. I mean, obviously, I think that's a big piece because we mm -hmm. we think about it survival of the fittest, but it's not necessarily just the individual that has to. The fittest is a is about the group. Well, the elite, the, the running bit came from my friend Dan Lieberman, uh, who is a professor at Harvard. Who everyone calls him the barefoot professor. He runs marathons barefoot, mm -hmm. and he's one of these people who's interested in locomotion. Now. Bipedalism originated six, seven million years ago, and the creatures were bipedal, but they wouldn't have been very good runners. They didn't have the right shape for it. By Homo erectus, there was the tall, thin frame. The head was demarcated from the body rather than being kind of joined with loads of muscles. So, And um, there was a waist. So if you can imagine uh, Steve Austin running along, his his arms and legs move in out out of phase with each other, and he keeps his eyes on the prize, uh, and that's how runners run. And it's a and of course the legs are quite close together to the centre of mass, and that and the legs are very long, and all these did decrease what scientists call the cost of transport. It makes running uh, quite economical uh, rather than the kind of waddling which earlier hominins did. Earlier hominins were really best up trees. I mean, they walked mm -hmm. around as well. But that was just, uh, they were kind of amateur walkers. But Homo, Homo erectus became a professional walker and also an endurance runner. So humans aren't very good sprinters, but they don't have to be. What humans are very good is, is endurance running. Endurance are brilliant. Humans are brilliant at endurance running. You don't have animals that do the endurance running that people do. And what people would do, they'd be cooperative. Homo erectus was more like a cooperative savannah predator, like a hunting dog. Mm -hmm. And uh, savannah predators do this now. They have an antelope and they don't do what lions and cheetahs do, which is single out something and then have a burst of speed. And they have to subdue it within that burst of speed. 
Otherwise, they can't do it. So what they do is they chase an antelope for mile after mile, and the antelope would have to stop. And then all the humans would stop, uh, but they'd stop a bit closer. And they'd go on and on until the actual animal just fell over and died of heat exhaustion. So, uh, But it had to be a cooperative thing, because even at the kill, a great big antelope could kill one human. So it had to be cooperative, and the cooperation state started at home. And that feeds into all the other things I've talked about, about motherhood and grannies and everything. And it all ties in with... With, with with sex, can we talk about can we talk about sex? Oh, oh, absolutely. Oh, okay. <laughs> right, okay. Well, he, humans are very very strange in many ways. One of the reasons we walk upright, I think, and also being hairless, is we dela- we display all our dangly bits to each other. I mean, before clothes were invented. Now, it's one of the great unexplained features of of human evolution that. Human males have very large penises, so be comforted, uh, anybody. Even if you think your weenie is very small, it's much bigger than a, a gorilla, which has an erection of an inch long. Uh, so, so, uh, uh, so, But why do humans have such large penises compared to their body mass? Strange. Yeah. And why do women have breasts that are visible at all times, irrespective of the menstrual cycle or lactation. Now, most apes, for example, or or mammals, they only develop breasts when they're lactating. Uh, I mean, if you look at your your bitch who's having puppies, she will have this row of teats along with the puppies. But when the puppies have all grown up, they wither away and you wouldn't know they were Mm -hmm. there. And, And that's the same with apes as well. So why do men have large penises? Why do women have large breasts? And also another thing that people do which animals don't do, is there's no kind of breeding season where uh, a female is obviously in heat with huge swellings and protuberances out the back end. That doesn't happen in humans. Humans may or not, may not be fertile at any time of year, and the reproductive status of a female is so obscure that even a woman may not know that she's fertile herself let alone to anyone else. I mean, unlike a chimpanzee where she's advertising it to the whole tribe that she's fertile. (laughs) Um, And then what happens in in another animal is they all have sex ostentatiously in public. So everyone can see who's the daddy. They can all see it. So we have this strange contradiction of features. We all look like we're all sexually available all the time, but we only have sex in private. Now, one thing that this leads to is nobody knows who's the daddy. It's never quite sure whose baby is whose. And this is actually a good thing for cooperation, because going back to the hunters, it enforces cooperation if a hunter knows, if a hunter is um, hunting for his family, but he doesn't quite know if his baby is his and <laughs> or if his baby is someone else's. So... If nobody is quite sure whose child is whose, it enforces a cooperation on the group. Now, this sounds like cod psychology, but I think um, (laughs) it happens. It's much. I don't think humans are like primates. I think humans are more like birds uh, because you have a lot of birds that are cooperative, what's called cooperative breeders. They all breed in a huge swarm all together. They have loads and loads of nests all together, all making a tweeting noise. uh, And... The young often stay at home to raise the siblings, and everything happens together. But nominally, each pair is in a pair bond. Mm. Uh, Now, but then it's while the male is out foraging. I mean, it's been seen in various kinds of bird. The female is not above a bit of nest hopping while the male is away, and it's the same with humans. I mean, uh, ask any paediatrician who will say that the rate of what scientists chastely call extra pair paternity is much higher than society would care to admit. Mm. And, um, you know, there's a, 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 blues, a blues song that a friend of mine wrote called The Butcher's Daughter. It's a father talking to his son, don't fall in love with the butcher's daughter because you, you know, the butcher's daughter is your sister, but don't tell your ma. <laughs> <laughs> well, staying, staying uh, in, in that musical theme, but also staying with the book, you talked about early cave paintings, uh, the location of them being influenced by... A location in the cave. Yeah, that there's something resonant, uh, possibly even musical about yeah. about that. That it space. Was, it was found a long time ago that this 
<laughs> I wrote a piece about this in the London Times. Years ago, I used to write science under the Nature banner in the London Times. And I was trying to find a piece to publish on April 1st. Uh, and I found this great paper that showed that the parts of caves where paintings were most densely together happened to be acoustically resonant. And the, the scientists found this by whistling in the cave and measuring the echoes. And our publishers, our pub, we published it on April the 1st, and of course people thought it was a great wind-up. But it's actually, oh. <laughs> it's, 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 it's actually true that because sometimes you find great big walls of caves with no paintings on, and yeah. then you find peculiar little crawl spaces that are hard to get to with paintings in odd parts that you wouldn't think would be a good place to paint anything. Um, and it seems that paintings are generally placed. I mean, this is all very hypothetical, but in some some of the caves in France, it's been shown to be the case that uh, paintings tend to go with resonant sound spaces, like with good acoustics. Uh, and this leads one to the suggestion that painting was all part of a set of rituals that included music and dance. Uh, now, music is a very, very ancient thing. Neanderthals probably made little bone flutes. It's known that early humans did. And, of course, we're bipedal. And, you know, being the elite fighter jets, we're very good at music and dance. And you find in every culture, music and dance are very central to the cultural and spiritual life of a, of a people. Um, so at the end of the book, I cultivate a, a space where, at the, uh, where an initiate would go into a cave and the shaman would say, you know, place your handprint here and then we'll all sing a song. But, you know, coming of age rituals. I mean, when my kids were bat mitzvah and they didn't want to learn all that Hebrew. And I said, look, it's very easy. In other tribes, you have to walk over red hot coals. <laughs> or, or have your tongue pierced or something. Here you get to recite some Hebrew and have a party. I mean, you know, and, and you get you get a you get a Mac Pro. I mean, it used to be a fountain pen, but you know the the <laughs> so all these things. And there's lots of, but the key is there's lots of music and there's dancing and there's ritual and there's songs and it's communal validation yeah. in some spiritual way. Uh, and so I think that goes right back to the cavemen. <laughs> I think it's perfect. Uh, but that we only have a few minutes left and we need oh, to talk. We do need to talk oh, a little no. bit about Beethoven because you yeah, brought up uh, the pastoral symphony. Oh, uh, and then I want to tie this into the book by asking, so how does, uh, I mean, you, you, I don't know this much about Beethoven, how he continued to compose. I mean, the ninth symphony was composed while he was mostly deaf. Yeah. Right. I know. I mean, Amazing. How the hell did, how the hell could he do that? Well, I suppose it's because all the music was in his mind. He could hear, he could hear it in his mind. And because he was a, a very good, painstaking composer who'd done it all his life, he, he had a, a good idea of which pitch would sound best and which would go together. But of course, I suppose being deaf, there was a kind of experimental uh, side to him because, you know, listen to the late quartets, real experiment with dissonance. Yes, and, yeah. uh, but of course, they, they shouldn't work. That they do, uh, and uh, perfectly. Uh, and you look at musicians who it's musicians who learn all the rules and break them, who work like Bach. Basically, wrote the book on fugue on late Baroque polyphonic music, and he wrote the book. Fugues had to have a certain rule. You know, this is how you wrote a fugue. But all the best fugues he did, he broke all his own rules. He put things in odd intervals and strange keys, and that's what keeps them interesting. So it's the dissonance, just a little bit, that makes things that makes things uh, work. And I remember this in my own life. My parents' piano tuner came to tune the piano, and I was, what, about 15, and this guy was just a kid, and he showed me blue notes and mm. sevenths ah. and the pentatonic scale, and after that I was away. <laughs> You know, he didn't. He didn't dare show me the tritone, which I think was banned in church music because <laughs> it, was, it was satanic. Well, you could say the same thing about Bella Fleck on mm. uh, banjo, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. as or Pat Metheny uh, mm. being a hardcore jazz guy mm. moving mm. into these this very experimental world. Mm. Um, it, you know, uh, of learning all the rules and breaking them. Yeah, uh, but, but you have to know that... the rules. You have to know the rules before yeah. you can break them. Well, you're uh, kind of that way, aren't you? Just just a bit. I mean, you were a, a trained as a paleontologist, but yeah. then you kind of gave up the research and 
sort of well, carve your uh, so own I, path. I, I describe myself as a recovering paleontologist. Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't have the kind of concentration for pure research. I, 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 was, I always wanted to, to write. And when I was at college, I was always writing. If you're a writer, you are a writer. I mean, you can become a better writer by writing more, but you tend to find people who are writers have always been writing. You can't help it. I'm writing for the college magazine. I'm not really interested in what I was doing. So I go to the next one and say, tell me about what you're doing. And so that's how, but it was a lucky break. I mean, I, uh, I was finishing my thesis and by a series of unlikely events that we don't have time to go into, I found myself on Friday as a graduate student and on Monday as a trainee news reporter at Nature. I mean, mm. it, I just, it wouldn't happen now. Uh, and so there I was on Monday morning turning up at the Nature office and saying, they say, they say I said, what would you like me to do? They said, write this news story about radiological protection guidelines. I said, I don't even know how to spell radiological protection guidelines. <laughs> um, and I said, uh, uh, we want 300 words. And I said, oh, when? They said, lunchtime, no pressure. So um, I got very quickly, I got very good at re- seeming authoritative about things I knew nothing about, which is essentially journalism. And I had a marvelous <laughs> men- I had a marvelous mentor who was the late John Maddox, the then editor of Nature, who was a micromanager par excellence. He would just say, Here, Henry, you go and do this. And if you just fell on your face, he didn't mind. He knew you'd pick up, you knew you'd learn from the experience. So that's how it happened. And um I've always been writing a book. I mean, my parents would say to me when I was scribbling, What are you doing, Henry? And I'd say, I'm writing a book. But, so I've always been writing books. And when I finished my PhD thesis, I was desolate. So I just wrote books. I kept yeah. having to wow. write, redo it. Um, I wrote books on entirely, well, I wrote a book about the origin of vertebrates, which was nothing to do with my PhD thesis, but I had to teach it when I was a, yeah. a TA. And there was no books and there was no nothing to do. So I thought I'd write the book. And I've, and I've become an expert on the origin of vertebrates quite by accident, which is strange. So I've, I've written fiction because i felt that i really do need to write fiction if i'm going to call myself a writer um it's more or less successful but i tend to stick to popular science because you know rule one write what you know uh so that's what you do uh so uh, i'd like just two questions or a a, a two-fold question what's the next book because you're always writing a book. What's the next one? And then what's the next album? What's the next record? Well, the, the next book is, um, which I'm not going to write another expletive book. No, never. No, never going <laughs> to write one. It's no. probably going to be about human extinction because I um, I was very vague about it in the book, but I kept thinking about it. And my feeling is human extinction is going to happen quite soon. And I, I wrote an article in Scientific American about it, which seems to have given everyone the screaming abdab. So obviously there is a, there is something, and so I'm starting to get ideas together about that. But who knows if it'll happen? And the next album, well, you know, I was a live musician, but lockdown rather killed that. And um, so I've been uh, recording at my home studio, Flabby Road. And uh, you know, before we started the interview, we we're talking. I collaborated with a guitarist friend of mine who I was in the band with 25 years ago. And even though we haven't seen each other for decades, we've started to collaborate on uh, albums his name's adrian thomas so we go under the name of g and t <laughs> and our album our album ice and a slice is available on apple music folks and uh it's just basically good old-fashioned rock because we're a load of good old he's the rockingest grandfather you'll ever meet is adrian with fantastically long guitar solos that i just oh, love yeah yeah well you know i write i write all the songs uh so on the album sleeve it's adrian thomas does guitar guitar more guitar extra guitar with extra servings of guitar guitar on the side and guitar <laughs> and i do i i credit myself as other stuff so i do all the other <laughs> stuff um and um i uh so in lockdown i had a songwriting hot streak and we did stuff that was deliberately a homage to you know jeff beck that was the one you liked him uh your silver lining and yeah, uh, silver lining yeah and we we did a homage to Joe Satriani in his funk phase called uh, Bunky Flues. And we did a deep purple homage called Indigo and a 
uh, you know, there's, you can hear you can hear all our influences. They're totally shameless. You know, status oh, quo to Pink but Floyd. Delightful, delightfully shameless. Um, yes. Well, now I've got the Korg Nautilus. I can do the most amazing sounds. I mean, I did. You know, with a with Ice and a Slice, I had a Clavinova piano. I had my Krumer organ, and I had my iPad, which has got the most amazing Moog and Prophet and Oberheim uh, synths on it. And so I did all that. Uh, oh, all the old fantastic old keyboard so it sounds like i'm rick wakeman um but it, it's not it's just the <laughs> ipad mostly but but now i i'm all tooled up so so there will be another gnt album when adrian can Good. tear himself away from the six bands he's currently in to actually and there will be there will be a cover there will be a cover Ooh. version oh mm. nice. i can tell i shall i tell you what it's going to be ah. it, it's, it's, it's going to be yeah it's going to be um, well, look, I'll just say, um, Lunacy and Genius, your name is Tice Van Leer. I'm just going to give you that clue there. And I'm going to go and practice my yodeling. <laughs> <laughs> Henry, thank you. We, 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 you know what, we're going to have to come back and have another conversation with you because we have more and more questions and it was just fantastic. Great insight. Fantastic stories. Thank you. Well, very you're great. you're very welcome, and it's been such fun. It's been such fun talking about stuff. Well, I love the sound of my own voice, but I mean, it's talking about you about <laughs> thing, things we all like. You know, it's the sort of thing that in the old days when people used to go to the pub um, and breathe each other's exhales, oh, God. Oh, <laughs> yeah, oh, <laughs> um, we would have a good old chat over a pint uh, about this yeah. sort of thing. Yes. Uh, it's just been so much fun. Loved it. Loved it, loved it, loved it. Virtual pint to you. So yes, there we go. Uh, live long and prosper and other <laughs> stuff. <Yeah. laughs> Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our discussion with Henry, have a free flowing conversation, and talk about whatever else comes into our small but well organized brains. I love that you emphasize that because that was a huge takeaway for me. It's a, a so much more about organization in our brains than it is just about size. And it ended up getting, I just read another article on this about how like a dolphin's brain is by body weight, like twice as big as a human's. And, you know, so they're connected to things. They know that the Dolphins are connected to things that we don't even perceive mm. way beyond our cognition, but it, but they can't talk, at least not the way we can. Well, it's our organization that helps that. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I have a huge brain and I know that that, that <laughs> helps me see and have these connections to other things that other people don't see. Which is almost like a dolphin. Almost, You're almost I'm, dolphin. I am dolphin-like, I think. Don't you? <laughs> and that I can't God. talk and that I... <laughs> It's more of a squeak. Yeah. <laughs> and you're you're good in the water. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, this is going to be you know, we haven't even had anything to drink and yet I think we we are going to be a little loopy in this in this grooving session. I apologize listeners. Cuz it was Henry. It, it was, was so Henry. much fun. It was a great conversation and uh yeah, this is just great. So so Tim, love this idea that look it's not necessarily the brain size. Brain size is com a component of it, but it's really yep. that organization of the brain and how it's structured. And as as we're talking about this, when we think about the brain, you know, the prefrontal cortex, the that aspect of the brain is that last part that has really kind of taken us from our, our ancestors into the humans that we are. The Homo sapien species is because yeah. of that final adaptation. And I love this idea of look, how the brain works is just as important, if not more important than the size of the brain. Yeah. The organization stuff was so critical to, uh, to, to Henry's discussion that I thought that was really great. I also just want to say, even around this topic of uh, dispelling this myth, but in general, one of the things that Henry really did for me is he inspires me to think more about studying the human condition in its biggest picture. And I just I just want to say that because he helps us understand the evolutionary side of how we got here, that it makes me more curious about why we do what we do. Yeah, that's a really I, great I mean, because, again, yeah. if you think about how evolution works, right, evolution is this idea that, hey, we are we are 
um, having some advantage that uh, allows our species to propagate in, in a manner that continues the species on and through whatever genetic mutations and other aspects of this that then lead to higher propagation rates and survival of, of these is not necessarily survival of the fittest, it's survival of the species of your genes, right. then you're going to continue. And the interesting piece of this is, so those evolutionary elements allowed us to survive in a savanna and in the environment that we are in, and we don't live in that same environment, and yet our evolution hasn't caught up to that. So we've evolved to live in a certain way and a certain kind of pattern that today's modern world isn't necessarily the same as what we had evolved to. So some of the things that we do, some of the ways that we think may not be optimal for today's environment or at least seem as rational as we do. So we go back to this rational versus irrational piece and all those fundamentals. It's it's crazy. Yeah, well, let's just start with bipedalism. We talked about it a little bit in the introduction. And Henry just so quickly pointed out the fact that it's the fact that we have this vertical structure creates a lot of compression and that leads to the biggest cause of ab- absenteeism in the workplace today like <laughs> oh my gosh you know like we weren't built to be standing or sitting for these long periods of time yeah. and, and i'm pretty sure that somewhere along the line my genetic code got disconnected from the early runners on the savannah because i tried to run a marathon a a few years ago and i got to the the 20 uh, in my training i got to the 20 mile run but i got injured (laughs) and couldn't couldn't run the 26.2 miles and i'm pretty sure that my ancestry started with picking potatoes back in ireland (laughs) (laughs) that's kind of my thought about that no but so but this idea right this idea that look we weren't the fastest but we had greater endurance and that because we were bipedal we were standing up our eyes are in the front of our our face we're looking out we're taller so we can see above things the fact that we work in a communal group, right? This idea that it's, you, you know, we we didn't evolve to be the solitary hunter that no. is out there hunting. We yeah, hunted in small communities. And I loved him talking about grandmas, right? And this idea <sighs> of, of, all right, so we are one of the only species where women live longer then they can actually reproduce in a significant way. Yeah. Right? You go through menopause and all of a sudden you're no longer a contributing to the propagation of the species outside of the fact that now you're passing on cultural information that you're passing yeah. on, you're taking care and allowing, you know, parents to, you know, do other things. And so with that, I, again, I didn't think about that as we think about how we work and then all of the serotonin and other neurotransmitters that come in that show this like connectiveness to our group and, and tribe. Man. Yeah. Well, two things on that. One, I love the explanation and the understanding that has come to the scientific community that uh, that women can are are unique in the human species because they they live long beyond uh, reproductive. And so this whole survival of the fittest thing isn't just about having more babies. It 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 is uh, much more complex than that. I love that thank you for pointing that out. Uh, so I, I'm glad that we like we're coming to understand that. But I also love the things that we can't explain. And when, when Henry started talking about like penis size and breasts <laughs> without lactation and who's your daddy and like these are these are like unexplainable are just not yet explained things that I love that. First of all, he's got the passion and the curiosity about this stuff and that we're still trying to understand ourselves. We're starting to still trying to understand just who we are, what the human condition is really about. I I love that. But think about, think about the way, and, and this goes back into Jonathan Haidt's work on moral foundations and other factors. You know, we've evolved to a certain degree with these things, with, you know, outsized penises, which I'm 
actually kind of feeling a little bit better about us now as a, as a, you know, it's like <laughs> a good reminder. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's a, that's a good no. thing. Right. And, and, and obviously, you know, breasts that don't, that are large on, on all times, not just lactating being, or not, not yeah. lactating or not. And this idea that, all right, so there's some, some of the mores that we have as, as humans about our sex and having sex in private and the, the yeah. behaviors that we have around that are reflective of some of those naturally occurring evolutionary factors of what we have. And think about that. We think about the, this is, this is the, the experiment that I've been doing since the conversation with Henry is like, so what if that wasn't the case, right? What if we didn't have larger penises than gorillas do? What if we, what if women didn't have breasts that, you know, were large at all times? How would that change some of the sexual mores that we have? And how would that change then how we interact as a group? What if we, you know, women could bear children up into like late into their lives. And so there was, wow, there was this element of, you know what, I'm not going to care for my grandchildren because I still have to care for my own kid, children. Whew. So you think about the what ifs, you think about those counterfactuals, you look at this from a different perspective. And that I think sheds light on our human condition and the behaviors and how we think and different pieces. And I think it is an interesting experiment. And I, you know, I don't know what we can take from that, but there, it's just fascinating to me. So, well, it sounds like we're going to be a lot more like other primates that we're going to be a lot less human by taking some of those things away. And that's a fascinating question. If we could still develop the brains that we have, I, it sounds like there's a science fiction story in this, actually. <laughs> is what it sounds like. Can, uh, can I jump over to something that it was a little bit random about the paintings on the cave walls? Because they were in acoustically resonant areas within the caves? Yeah, yeah, you totally nailed that because that is exactly <laughs> it. That that, and And this is a theory, just we're going to reinforce that Henry – express this as a concept, not a, not a conclusion, but the idea that the early cave painters might have been thinking about where's it kind of cool to hang out and do this painting? Like, where's my groove, right? Mm. Where do I get my groove? Where do I, where's, what sounds good? Oh, this is a good place. I'm inspired to paint here because it sounds good. That, that art, that the, the creative visual art and music went together from an early could have gone together from a very early part of human history is so cool. What What's fascinating to me is, look, we have a, a historical record of the cave paintings, and so we can see that art. What we don't have a good record of is, is the singing, music. I mean, was that part of it? Was it not? We can make some assumptions, and given kind of our, you know, prevalence for thinking and talking about music in a, in a yeah. behavioral science kind of way, I would agree with that kind of conjunction that, yes, look, we are, as humans, we, we've talked about this, right? Music is an emotive element. It, it creates yeah. emotions and art creates emotions and, and to a certain degree probably tells stories and is a narrative that people are, are thinking about. And so why wouldn't our ancestors have done that and found these spots where their their voices sound you know like like i can sing in the bathroom and it sounds a lot better than me singing out here which any of those singing sound horrible compared to you know any normal singing kind of thing but you know i'm gonna well, I, sing I in the bathroom heard... a lot more good than, you know because good. i think that's a good thing for all of us yeah there you go <laughs> I haven't heard you sing in the bathroom, but I'm pretty certain it's it's a lot better than you singing out in other places. So <laughs> that's all I want to say. Because you have heard how horrible I am at singing in, in the other places. That, oh, yes. You don't 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 even all deny right, it. Okay. Don't deny it. There you okay. go. All right. So so what was the other piece that I was interested in is what he said, what Henry says about the end about. Um, Bach and was it Fugues? I can't pronounce what. Yeah, it, Fugue. Yeah, yeah the, the Fugue. Yeah. yeah. Where Bach knew all the rules and then he broke many of them. Yes. And, yeah. you know, again, it doesn't get into the evolution kind of things in this, but 
as I think about this from my perspective, it's it's this interesting aspect of all right, as humans, we have the ability to think beyond our our nature. We're not instinctually driven. We can we can know what we should do and we can choose to do something different. And I think that's really fascinating. And I think when we think about creativity and people, it's this idea of knowing the rules and then choosing to say, hmm, maybe if we took a different perspective and broke some of the rules that we we have, those cultural rules, that, that might change how this shows up and is one of the creative things. I don't know. I want to just support that because I think it's especially true and important in creative ventures, whether it's composition or uh, painting or you know any, any kind of visual or or audio art, but also in product development or any kind of innovation uh, of of new products or new concepts, new technologies. Being able to step beyond the current boundaries of this is what the rules are and into a space that's beyond the current rules is really important. Yeah. And, you know, Silicon Valley is built on people breaking rules. So one of the things, though, is, is so it's there's a thing about you can break the rules without knowing you're breaking the rules. Right. And th- there's some value to that. Right. That's the novice trying something and not understanding yeah. things and getting some yeah. of that. But I think more importantly is when you know the rules and then you go beyond the rules, you break those rules, knowing what the rules are. And I I, I always go back to the scene I saw. I think it was from In the Heart of Darkness, the story about um, Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now, right, where Francis Ford was talking with Dennis Hopper, who and I'm sure I've talked about this on the show before. So forgive me, listeners. But he was talking to Dennis Hopper, who was obviously high as a kite. I mean, just out of it, right? And Dennis is going, man, why do I need to know the the, the words, all this stuff? I'm not doing a very good Dennis Hopper here, but, you know, man, you know, Marlon doesn't know the words. He just ad-libs. That's what I'm doing. And, and Francis Ford Coppola just comes back to him and he goes, it's because Marlon Brando knows his words and he's adapting to the situation. You don't know the words, Dennis. <laughs> that's that's it. Yeah. Right. That's that's the, that's the whole thing. That is the, the cool thing. And we're going to have a link. Uh, we will have a link in the show notes about uh, with to box fugue or a fugue of box. Uh, you know, uh, listen, regular listeners know that I'm a huge Beethoven fan, but box fugues are amazing. And uh, you, you have to experience it as a, as a piece of music. And we should also try to link to that that piece of uh, the heart of darkness. Yeah. That, that exchange between Francis Ford Coppola and and a very high Dennis Hopper. Let's see are, if we can find that. That'd be awesome. So I think we should. Yeah. Well, I think that wraps up another episode of Behavior Grooves. What do you think, Tim? Oh, really? <laughs> no, I know. Henry was so great. I loved Henry. I yeah. We need to get him back just to. Yeah. You know, if nothing else, it's fun for us. Sorry, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Kind of gets away from our behavioral science-y kind of thing. But I think there's some really important insights that we get. Anyway, we hope you've enjoyed our conversation with Henry and that you've come away with a slightly better appreciation for how complex we are as humans. Yeah. And, and just to, you know, riff back off of Kurt's thing, you know, we are, it's important for us to be the greatest rule breakers on the planet. Yes, I guess. that is a fantastic. Right. So let's be rule breakers there you go ah so how about this week groovers how about if you take a lesson or two from henry and maybe break some rules maybe just a little bit yeah like like what 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 rule like you know walking across the street at the corner doing some jaywalking what what kind of rules are we talking about break a rule to leave a review like you have a rule of not leaving any reviews break that rule and leave a review (laughs) I was thinking like, no, like the, the, the social norm is, is to not say hi to somebody on, on the commute yeah. into work. Say yeah. hi to somebody because we know that, hey, you're going to be happier doing that. There you go. Absolutely. And because you listen to Behavioral Grooves this week, we hope that it helps you in some small way that as you live through your week, you go out and find your groove. 